Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us today. It is Graduate Recognition Day at Woodlawn, and if you have not had a moment to meet our graduates, stop by the website sometime today and find out who they are. And while you're watching, say a brief prayer for each one of them. And don't forget to send them a card of congratulations as well. They will certainly appreciate it. If you are worshiping with us online today, we would love to know that you are here. Text the word WORSHIP to 828-374-1660 and we will know immediately that you are here. Thank you for spending time with us today. If this is your first time visiting with us at Woodlawn, please text the word GUEST to 828-374-1660. Just send us a text to that number with the word GUEST and we will recognize your presence with us today as well. Dr. Yount will be talking about it later in the service, but if you feel a tug at your heart today to ask Jesus into your life, he will make an immediate difference in you, in your life, and for all eternity. No other decision you make in life is as important as where you will spend eternity and who will be the Lord of your life here on earth. Text the word Jesus to 828-374-1660 and someone will reach out to you today and set up a time to share with you how simple it is to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If you're watching here at 1030 on Sunday, you may want to pause the video and go to Woodlawn Baptist Church Conover on Facebook and check out the live parking lot drive-in service there. You can come back here later if you miss some of the notes in the sermon, and you may get to see each graduate presented there. In just a couple of weeks, we will be doing a parking lot baptism service for those who have asked Jesus into their lives and have been waiting to be baptized. If you are one of those, please text the word BAPTIZE, that's with a Z, BAPTIZE, to 828-374-1660, and we will be in touch to get you on the baptism list. Again, thank you for watching today. Pray for our graduates. Encourage them. And let's join together now in worship. For God so loved the world, all of us, you and me. He loved us so much he sent his only son, Jesus. The firstborn of creation, sent to take our place, to bear our burden, to suffer our consequence. We were far from God, but God didn't want to be far from us. Jesus came to bring us home. As a prodigal returns to their father, so too could we return to our Creator. A simple plan with just one requirement. belief. For whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have life. Life eternal. At the very heart of God is love. Indescribable, unrelenting, unstoppable love. That love shines a light, guiding us home, for God so loved the world. Let's stand and sing together. I think everybody knows this song. If you don't, let's learn it. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been, all right, sorry, let's start over, guys, please. Let's start it over. Now, we'll try again. Ready? If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been 
again here in the same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside there's a better light there's a better light if you got jane he's a pain taker if you feel can feel it somebody testify testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify testify if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody test to testify, testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chain, he's a chain break. Sing it out now. If you got pain, oh yes, he's a pain breaker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chain. He's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chain, he's a chain breaker. He's a chain breaker. Oh, yes, he is. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a seat, please. You know, Dr. Young has said many times that there's no such thing as coincidence, and I really believe that. God is always in control. Um, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, when I told Miss Daltrey what I was singing this morning, I had no idea that it was Cancer Survivor Sunday. I'm blown away by this. I watched my both of my grandparents, but particularly my grandfather, I was in the hospital with him for two weeks, basically watching him drown to death from lung cancer. But through that whole process, I saw him restore his relationship with God and the peace that it brings. And, you know, they'll be in the lyrics of this song, God is dear when our lives are great and everything is sunshine. But if we hold tight to him in times of trial and trouble, He's even more so. So, thanks. <laughs> I have 
known him in the best of times When every day was nothing but sunshine And his blessings were my daily bread It was true, I knew him then and yet Now I know him as my shelter in the rain Yes, now I know him as my shepherd through the pain He is dear when life is easy But in heartache so much more and now I know him like I never have before. And if my faith had not been tested by the flame, and how could I have known these depths of grace? Cause what is trust until it's proven true? When I've seen the valleys he has brought me through Now I know him as my shelter in the rain Yes, now I know him as my shepherd through the pain. He is dear when life is easy, but in heartache so much more. And now I know him like I never have before. Yes, now I know him, the hand that led me through the dark. God is dear when life is easy, but in heartache so much more. Cause now I, I know him like I never have before. Like I never have before Now I know him Thank you, Brandon. Would you stand again, please? Let's sing together. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light. A story of peace and light. The darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us His Son to save us and show us that God is love and show us that God is love for the darkness shall turn to dawning 
and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth the kingdom of love and light. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. On a conscious name I come to you share his love as he told me to. He said freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you Thank you. Please be seated, and this is the time for our special Gideon offering. God's love for us is so high and deep and wide that our Savior did not and would not endure being separated from us by what sin had done. And so he gave his life. He suffered and died instead of us. He was buried, and then he defeated death and rose to life. Because he lives, we can live forever with him. All this Jesus did for us. It's why we will never get tired of singing his name in praise. What a name, the name above all others, the glorious name of Jesus. You were the word at the beginning. beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You did You brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my what a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could 
not hold you the veil tore before you you silence the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no right looked up and he was there, just right there. Scared us at first, but then again at this point, why were we so surprised? I guess that kind of tells you how frustrating we were to him at times. We'd seen him do so many things. Miracles. Why did we act so shocked? I asked him if I could walk to him. And when did he ever say no to us? Never. Not once. And so I got out of that boat, just hopped out of it like we were on land or something. and I felt the wind, it uh, felt like it just went straight through me. All my confidence just slipped out of the bottom of my feet.
You should have heard them when he rode into Jerusalem. I, I can still hear them. Hundreds just lining the streets, chanting it over and over and over and over and over and over. Hosanna in the highest. Salvation has come. And they finally felt it. Finally celebrated him. And I, I already knew him. I knew he is the kind of king who reaches out and pulls you up, even if you have doubts. The one who always comes to help us. The one who always saves you when you call his name. Good morning and welcome to our morning worship. It's a delight to have you join us by internet. And we're looking today at Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. This is Graduate Sunday at Woodlawn Baptist Church. And we are certainly proud of all of our graduates and their families. And today, this is a special message to them and to all of us, because life is a process of graduations from beginning to the end. But join me now for a moment of prayer, and then we'll get started. Our Father, may you bless us today. We thank you for the very fact that we can come together uh, by internet, and we can worship you together as your people. And we ask for you to meet with us today we pray that you will speak to our hearts and that we will know that we've been in your presence. We thank you for our graduates. We thank you for their families. We ask you that you bless them all the days of their lives and use them to fulfill your purpose and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, look with me at Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22. And the Bible says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. Think of that. Jesus, the Son of God, on the mountain, alone, praying. And as you think of that setting in your mind, I want to share with you a story. It is a story about veteran guides at a tourist park in the Alps who say they have seen this happen time and time again. The day almost begins always the same way. A few dozen tourists sign up for a day of mountain climbing. The brochure promises a experience that will never be forgotten. The hike will take about eight hours total with a lunch break at a midway station complete with restrooms. The brochure says that it will be a rugged hike, but it can be done in, for anyone in reasonably good condition. Parts of the climb are steep, but most of the trail is easy terrain. Experienced guides, wide paths, and guardrails are at needed points, guaranteeing a safe return. By nine o'clock that day, about two dozen hardy climbers are on hand. The half dozen guides distribute the gear, water bottles, backpacks, with lunch, of course, sunscreen, and plenty of first aid kits. The group starts at a casual pace. Some of the younger hikers encourage the guides to go a little bit faster. There's a lot of talking and a lot of joking and laughing. Some even try to sing a song or two. By the beginning of the second hour, the mood has changed. There's very little talking. There's no singing. The incline is steeper. Breathing in the thinning air becomes a little more difficult. And the guides have no one calling for them to pick up the pace. 
In the third hour, everyone's legs except for those who are the best conditioned are starting to ache for, from the uphill track. Finally, the group rounds a bend and there it is. A beautiful mountain vista opens up in front of them. A beautiful sight, the Midway Station, nestled right at the edge of an alpine meadow. A few in that group almost run the last dozen yards trying to get to the benches. The backpacks are tossed aside. Water bottles are open with gusto and lines form for the restrooms. It is always this way, the guides say, but the real story is yet to take place. After a leisurely lunch, the head guide gathers the group for a pep talk before they head out for the rest of the climb. You've done well, he tells them. I know it's been tough for some of you, but you've hung in there and you stayed together. That's good. We should make the summit in less than two hours, and I promise you, you've never seen anything like what you're going to see before. It makes the whole climb worth the effort, he said. The next hour or so of the climb <clears throat> will be the roughest part. But if you keep together like you did this morning, there should not be any problem. And then the guide said, the tour policy requires me to tell you that if anyone wants to, you can stop right here. Anyone who thinks that they cannot go on can wait here for the rest of us. You'll have plenty of shade and plenty of water. The trip back down the summit takes a lot less time than the climb up, so we should be back in a total of three hours. After that speech, most of the climbers energetically shake their heads and insist that there is no way they're going to stop. But there were a few who gazed around sheepishly, looking down at their feet that they had been rubbing and staring up at the trail and the incline. After a few questions, some of them decided to stay and you could see the relief on their faces. A few minutes later, the majority took off heading up the mountain. Those who stayed behind were in great spirits. They send the climbers off with a fair amount of good cheer, but as soon as they are to themselves, they start laughing and joking about how they're glad that they're not back on that trail. What happens next is always the same, and we'll return to our story in a few moments. Now, the story of the mountain hikers has much in common with our text today in God's Word. This Bible story is one that is very familiar to us. Most often when you hear preachers preach on this passage of Scripture, they tell the story of the attention being drawn to that fateful moment when Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus, puts his eyes on the storm, and then he sinks. That is certainly the key part of the account. But today, I want you to look with me at this story from a little different angle. We may have to do a, a bit of reading here and a bit of thinking together to see just as much a part of what really happened that day on the Sea of Galilee. There were several characters in this story, or sets of characters, if you will. The first, of course, is the Lord Jesus. It had been a big day for Jesus and the disciples. The master had just performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000, which was a high point thus far in his ministry. At the end of the day, he sent the disciples on ahead to cross the lake by boat, and he went up into the hills alone to pray. The disciples take their time. Maybe they fished a little bit. Maybe they just rested a little bit on the boat. But about midway on that trip, a great storm blew up, a headwind and it made that trip longer and harder than they had counted on. They're in the middle of that storm, and these experienced fishermen are afraid. They're about to perish, and Jesus came walking to them on the water. Make no mistake about it, it was a great miracle. The disciples, some of whom were fishermen, had never seen anything like it. They were at first terrified. The Bible says, they thought it was a ghost, 
and they were amazed when they recognized that it was the Lord Jesus coming to them, walking on the water. Now, all the while, Jesus had been watching them when he was praying on the mountain, watching them as they moved from calm waters into this headwind, into the middle of a storm. They thought they were going to perish, but Jesus had his eye on them. And the whole time, Jesus was watching. And we see here, whenever we read the New Testament, or the whole Bible, for that matter, and especially the four gospel accounts, our attention is always drawn to Jesus. That's the story of the, the God-man. He is the creator, the creator of everything the sustainer of life. And here we see Jesus in God's word, taking on the form of a man and living in our world, just like the rest of us, facing the same temptations and trials. What kind of person would you expect Jesus to be? If God came to this planet as a man, and he did through Jesus, wouldn't it be almost expected that he would be capable of feats that was greatly beyond what we could do. And he was. He healed the sick. He made the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He raised the dead to life. And the Bible presents Jesus in just this way. His miracles were surprising, and some did not believe. But on the other hand, each miracle that Jesus did was totally consistent with the life that he was trying to reveal to man, that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Master of creation. He could still the storm. He could walk on waves. But the Bible also presents him as the Master of men. There was something different about Jesus, something that drew other people to him, and especially the common folk who wanted to be near to him. They saw something in him. They heard the words that he said. And all of these things made them want to know him more and more. He had a way of pulling out the best in them. He seemed to be able to look deep down into a person's heart and a person's soul. And it seemed that as he did that, he saw not only the bad, but he saw the good. He saw the possibilities. He saw the potentials that other people had never even bothered to look for. He could inspire men and women with persistence to carry on that enabled them to keep going when most other people would give up. People discovered that they had second chances with Jesus. He's still that way today. Once you really see him and hear him, once you meet the real Jesus, you want to get closer to him. Once we understand the difference that Jesus Christ can make in our life, we never want to be without him. There is something that is eternally magnificent about Jesus. Well, that's the way it had been for Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He knew that normal men could not calm storms and they absolutely couldn't walk on the water. He had fished in these very waters many times before. He'd been swimming in them. He wasn't a dummy. He wasn't as gullible as many of us might have thought that he was. When he saw Jesus standing on that water, Peter quickly realized he was in the presence of a miracle. And what did he do? Well, I don't know what was going through his head, and I don't know why he said what he did. Peter may not even have known why he did it, but all of a sudden, Peter heard this familiar voice speaking. And he said, Lord, let me come down to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out of that boat and he started to walk on top of that water, walking to the Lord Jesus. I don't believe anyone in that boat was more surprised than Peter was when the Lord said, come. Now, what do you do? It's like one time I was at Disney World and my son was young and 
I asked him if he wanted to ride this huge roller coaster that had a, a big drop off at the end of it. And I thought he would be afraid. I thought he would look at that and say, no, I don't want to ride that. But he said, yes. And what else could I do? And we have a picture they took of us on that final drop. He was holding his hands up in the air and laughing. I had my hands clenched to the bar and my eyes closed, scared to death as we went over that last drop. Well, that may have been something that happened to Peter. When Peter said, Lord, let me come to you, he might have been thinking, well, and then Jesus said, come on. And Peter stepped out and he, in a fraction of a second, that seemed like an eternity, he pondered his options. The risks were big. He could slip over the side and sink with the waves high. He might be swept from the boat and drowned. Worse yet, his buddies in the boat would never let him live it down. But what did he do? He was walking on the water. He did that first one foot and then the other. He accepted Jesus' call. He stood on the water. But then a gust of wind blew and, and he got his eyes on the storm and he looked away from Jesus and he could feel himself sinking in that water, thrashing in the water. And at that very moment, Jesus reached down. Peter said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached down in those waves, took a hold of Peter and got him safely back in the boat. Now I thought about that and I believe Peter may have been a little embarrassed in the presence of Jesus. The others probably didn't say much. They probably threw him a towel and helped him dry off, but their grins and their chuckles were enough to let Peter know he was in for the ribbing of his life when they got him along later. Well, here is where I think I speculate a little bit on this story. I suspect those disciples were not nearly as hard on Peter as they planned. The more they thought about what had happened, the more they realized that Peter really didn't look as foolish as they thought. They didn't give him a hard time the next day at breakfast around the campfire. As they reminisced on the night, Peter starts to tell his version, and sure, he, he would speak before he thought. And he began to sink, but he walked on the water, and they hadn't. He got out of the boat, but they didn't. For the rest of their lives, they would have to listen to Peter tell of the baby steps he took on the water. And when laughter gives way to reflection, they soon realize that that's something they would never experience. Now think about this. They had the same opportunity as Peter. He spoke up, he stood up, he stepped out. They could have done the same. His was a step of faith but they would spend the rest of their lives thinking about what might have been. They would forever wonder what it must have felt like, what it would have been like. They will say for the rest of their lives, if only I had been like Peter. Well, remember those mountain hikers and the story I started to tell you? The guides say it's always the same. Those who stayed behind watched the others at the summit. Those who went the distance celebrated what those who stayed behind would never be able to celebrate. They know deep inside that they could have done it, but they chose not to. And never would they know the feeling of standing on top of that mountain and seeing what the others saw. And all they could say was listen to the stories and wish they had finished themselves. It's always that way. This mountain experience and this experience of walking on the water teach some valuable lessons to us. And I want to mention three lessons or four that I think are vital for all of our graduates today. And I want to ask you to listen very carefully. First, this teaches us, this story in the Bible teaches us 
that some of the best experiences in life require hard times and perseverance. That's a lesson we need to learn early. And graduates, if you can take hold of that lesson and put it in your heart and apply it to your life, it'll help you. You see, you have to climb the mountain to see the view from the top. You have to step out of the boat to experience walking on the water. If you always take the path of least resistance, if you take the easy way out, as you get older, you will look back and wonder what might have been. There's a second lesson I see here in this story. The only difference between drudgery and joy is often the difference between persistence and quitting too soon. Those who stayed behind did most of the work, but they received very little of the benefits. The joy came for Peter, who made it out of the boat. The joy came for the hikers who made it to the top of the summit. Too many people fail in the really important matters of life simply because they quit too soon. Graduates, remember, do not quit. Do not give up. We think quitting prevents us from failing only too late, too late to realize that it keeps us from succeeding. Winston Churchill was once asked to speak at a graduation service. He got up and he made probably the briefest speech that's ever been made. He said, never give up. Never, never give up. And he sat down. That's a message I think this story teaches us today. Be persistent in life. Never give up. No matter how hard, just keep on going forward. And then there's a third lesson, and this is one that's very important to learn as well. There is something worse in life than failing. Quitting when we could have finished and having to live with wondering what might have been is much worse than trying and failing. When you try and fail, at least you tried. And it's better to try and fail never than to try at all. What are your dreams, graduates? What is that thing in your heart and in your mind that you're passionate about? You have a desire. You have a purpose. You have a dream. What is it that God wants you to do? <clears throat> then refuse to quit. Be persistent. Go for it. Don't be afraid to fail. And here is one final lesson from God's Word. This is a lesson that is central to the whole story of the Bible. The safest place that you can be is in the center of wherever God calls you. Did you hear that? The safest place that you can ever be is right in the center of wherever God calls you. The most dangerous place is any place that is not with him. I hope you'll think about that. This week, you are facing one of those mountaintop experiences of life. Few events will rival its impact. Many of you are headed for college. Others of you will begin jobs and careers. It is an exciting time. Some of you are heading for the military. A few of you might be getting married soon. Some may not even have a clue about what's coming next. But regardless of whether your plans end in an exclamation point or a question mark, all of you are wondering about your future. And over the next few months and years, you're going to make many decisions that will affect you for the remainder of your lives. With many of those decisions, you will face opportunities to take the easy way out, to follow the path of least resistance. You can take a path that requires very little and promises life without risk. And you can decide to take that path. Or you can dream big dreams. You can seek out paths that are difficult 
and it requires the very best that you have to give and you're up to it with God's help you're up to it and God has put a dream and a desire in your heart and you can accept these responsibilities that will stretch you and challenge you at every step and every corner of your life if you take the second route you could fail there's no guarantees but there's something worse and that's getting to the end of your life and wondering wondering what if what if we're in a boat in the middle of the lake the master looks at you and me and the master says come get out of the boat we're at a rest stop in the middle of a mountain hike and we're halfway to the summit just a little more and we're going to have the the view of a lifetime and the experience of a lifetime jesus is our guide he calls us to the summit he calls us to get out of the boat what do you do from here well you can play it safe you can take it easy or you can take make some tough and risky decisions. You can dream some big dreams. You can stay and watch, or you can climb all the way to the summit. I want to encourage you to climb. Climb as high as God will let you climb. You can sit in the boat, or you can get your feet wet. It's your call. But one thing that I have learned from the Bible is this. You be careful and make wise decisions because once you decide, your decisions make you. And the greatest decision that any of us could ever make is to decide to make more than a living. You see, graduates, sometimes people get so focused on making a living that they don't make a life. And it's much more important to make a life how do you do that? It begins by giving your life to Jesus Christ, by walking with him day by day, by spending time with him and seeking his guidance and growing in his wisdom and letting him take you by the hand from this day forward and fulfill the purpose that he has placed you on this earth to fulfill. Years ago, a man in the church where I served as pastor owned a very large trucking business. If I mentioned the name of it, you would know it because you've seen the trucks go up and down the highway. Needless to say, this man had become very wealthy. I was talking to him one day and I asked him why he thought that he was so successful. Why is it that he had become so successful? I'll never forget what he said. He said, Ed, my goal in starting this business was never to get rich. My goal in starting this business was to serve the Lord by offering a quality service to other people. And you know what? He did that. And God blessed him immensely for it. Graduates, we are so proud of you. We love you. We pray for you. And we ask you to always remember to make your life's goal to serve God by serving others. That's what life is really all about. Don't be afraid to get out of the boat. Don't be afraid to climb the mountain and live for Jesus. That is the true meaning of life. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Father, as we close this message today, we pray for our graduates. You have a path for them to follow. You have gifted them and given them a desire that they might fulfill your call and purpose in their lives. Father, it will be a, a long way from today to where you want to take them. And we ask, that you give them strength to persevere. We ask that you give them determination to finish the course. We ask, Father, that you give them wisdom to make godly decisions. And we ask our Father 
that you walk with them through the power and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ until the day they come home to be with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you're listening today and there has never been a time in your life when you have accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, I'm asking you to do what Jesus asked Peter to do. It's time to get out of the boat. It's time to climb to the summit. It's time for you to say to Jesus, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I want to turn from my sin. I'm sorry for them. I ask you to forgive me. And I acknowledge that you are the son of God, that you died on a cross to save me, that you rose from the dead. And I receive you today by faith to be my Savior and my Lord. If you will pray that to Jesus and mean it sincerely with all your heart, Jesus will come into your life. He'll forgive your sin. He'll give you a home in heaven one day. And he'll walk with you for the remainder of your life. You say, well, will that mean my life will always be easy? No, but it means Jesus will be there when it is and when it's not. He'll see you through. If you would like to make a decision to unite with our church family today, we also invite you to do that. If you would like to uh, give us a prayer request, we'd be delighted to pray for you. We invite you to do that. You'll see the number to call or text on your screen. God bless you. Have a great, great day. And we look forward, the Lord willing, to seeing you next week. Same time, same place. Have a great day.